Hello and welcome to Pathways, where you are invited to join me for a visit with leaders in personal development and cultural evolution. This is your host, Paul O'Brien. At various times, we have all stayed too long in what doesn't work. The what doesn't work can apply to relationships, jobs, addictions, chronic pain, unresolved conflict, enmeshment in family drama, affiliation to a religion, organization, or institution, just about anything we become involved in. On the other hand, there are times when we don't stay long enough. We don't hang in there through thick and thin in a relationship or affiliation that really can work. There is also the mystery of timing, feeling and responding to the opportune time. Ultimately, our readiness depends on the ping of a timer that's not in our hands. Timing is a player in all of our comings and goings. The book we discuss today will combine psychological and Buddhist practices and help us to open to our own perfect timing for the big decisions in life and then act accordingly. Our guest today is David Rico, PhD, MFT, author of countless books, including today's feature, Ready, How to Know When to Go and When to Stay. Dave is a psychotherapist, teacher, workshop leader, and writer who works in Santa Barbara and San Francisco, California. He combines Jungian, poetic, and mythic perspectives in his work with the intention of integrating the psychological and the spiritual. His books and workshops include attention to Buddhist and Christian spiritual practices. And as those of you who are watching us on YouTube or on divination.com today could see, Dave held up his book. Dave, hold up your book again. It's a beautiful looking book and I want those people who are looking at it on YouTube to see your book. Thank you very much. And, and you hello. can see the two birds, one is staying and the other one is going. Right. Okay. Beautiful. And uh, Dave, welcome to Pathways. It's great to have you back. Well, thanks for inviting me, Paul. So here we are in 2022. And I must ask, how many books have you written so far? 20. 20 books. Wow. And in terms of your own livelihood, would you say you've been staying or going? Um, well, I'm staying with what I consider my life purpose, which is to share what I've been given the grace to know. Uh, and I'm hopefully not getting stuck in a lifestyle that doesn't really go anywhere. Well, so you, I'm constantly looking at my life and asking that question. And I and don't always come up with a proper answer. Well, if you're staying uh, as a writer and you're writing all these books and you keep writing new books, I'd say that that might be a really positive example of, of the power of staying. Well, I have um, what I consider my three graces. I have the ability to write, I have the ability to teach, and I have the ability to do therapy, which I've been doing for now for um, for quite a number of years. And the origin of the book is very simple. I asked myself, in your 50 years of doing therapy, what is the issue that came up the most? And it was definitely staying too long and what doesn't work. And we've all done it, including me. So, that is why I decided to write this. So there, to give some guidelines, like how do you know when to go? How do you know when to make a change? Or to stay put and work things out. 
And so and you then say, it occurred to me that there's more to it than that, that there's also a mysterious timing that has to be in place, that has to kick in to help you decide. It's uh, mysterious in the sense that you can't hurry it or delay it. But for some reason, uh, you can do it on, do something important on Tuesday, but you couldn't have done it on Monday. And if you wait till Wednesday, it'll be too late. This is what so I mean by time. In your practice, you've, are you saying that you've noticed that people have um, more of a tendency to not move than to impulsively move? In other words, their problems are more about staying than about going. Yeah, it's much more about staying. And one of the main reasons that we stay in situations that aren't really working for us or that are even um, causing pain for us is that we've been taught that it's more important to endure rather than to be happy. Rather than to be what? Happy. Like you're selfish if you're trying to be happy. Your purpose in life is to endure whatever the situation is and just stay put in order to accomplish that. Uh, it's kind of a, a, a self-negating view because you wind up uh, staying too long in what doesn't work. But how do we know what works, you know, and how do we know what's going to make us happy? You know, we happiness is a kind of a relative term, isn't it? I mean, you can't be happy all the time. Uh, no, it's not about being happy all the time. It would be more like, you know, it's working when, for instance, you, you listed relationship, job, affiliation with a group or religion, um, anything that represents a commitment of some kind that you've made, you have to keep reviewing it to see if it's still accomplishing what you wanted to accomplish to begin with. Now, regarding relationship, which is the main uh, topic of the book, you're asking yourself, are my needs being fulfilled? And am I helping the other person fulfill his or her needs? That's the first question. And the second question is, am I, in general, pleased and happy to be in the relationship? And third, do I feel as if this is the right fit for me. So if all three of those are in place, needs being met in both directions, this seems to be the right fit and I'm generally happy to be here. But your, your feelings about, I mean, <laughs> let's talk about relationships. There's a certain arc to any relationship in the beginning, you know, we're full of hope and uh, and also uh, full of projections because we don't really know the other person that well. And so we have these um, hopeful projections uh, and those uh, projections, which you could call romantic projections, like falling in love, that kind of thing, they tend to dissipate over time in any relationship because you get to know the other person and you become, you might use the word disillusioned, but disillusionment is not a totally negative thing. In other words, the illusions that you had about their perfection, et cetera, uh, dissipate. So things change because nothing is permanent. You know, the law of impermanence that they have in Buddhism, um, mm -hmm. which you teach also. Um, so since nothing is permanent, isn't just about anything going to have a half-life or get stale after a point, whether it's a job or a relationship or whatever? 
you're bringing up an important point, which is that everything in life goes through phases. But in each phase, the same three questions arise. Are my needs being at least moderately fulfilled? And am I helping the other person moderately fulfill their needs? Uh, am I generally happy being here? And does this seem like the right fit for me? So uh, we're not, we haven't been trained to ask those three questions. Our three question, our one question is, um, how can I keep putting up with the way it is? And I why is my that? Do, I saw my parents do that. They were putting up with each other. They were putting up with us, us three kids. And uh, I felt sorry for them later in life because they hadn't been um, open to the option that we have in our generation, which is it's okay to be happy and want a situation in which you can be happy. Yeah, and it's, it's okay to get a divorce. It's okay to change. Of course, if you have children, that kind of uh, it, it is a long-term commitment that two people presumably make, hopefully consciously make, um, that keeps them together. You know, what you're saying reminds me of what Henry David Thoreau said, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation, or one might substitute the word resignation. Mm. People become- Those two words have to do with uh, the enduring. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. So, you know, one can understand why people want to endure if they have a family to raise, that they've both committed to, or if they're economically interdependent so that they can't really afford to be single. There's all kinds of reasons. There's some practical reasons why people stay uh, in a relationship that's not fulfilling, but that's not what you're talking about in this book. Well, that leads us to the second topic, which is how do I work on my situation and we also weren't taught about how to do this until the self-help movement began how do i um stay here in a way that makes it work better and what i propose in the book is that uh, we would address our issues we would try to work through them and then we would try to make agreements about changes that we can both make and to which we can commit ourselves so the first commitment is based on, on the wedding day as you said is often based on projections which are expectations that come from my own mind as to what the partner will be like and what marriage will be like. But as the years pass, or even as the months pass, you find out it's not really going to be like what you thought it would be. So you would adjust to the new reality, but you would stay long enough to work on it, on the relationship so that um, it functions better. And because. nowadays we're lucky because we have so many books and therapy that help us get there. <clears throat> Excuse me. Are you talking about couples therapy? Yeah, mm -hmm. that show you how to do whatever the work is that could make it better. You know, just combining the terms relationship with work is a little dispiriting. Uh, you know, I mean, I remember there was an author who came out, I won't mention her name, but she came out with a book quite a long time ago called Making Relationships Work. And I thought that it would have been more aptly entitled Making Relationships Into Work. 
And we have this concept that relationships should be joyful and fun and make us happy. Um, so the idea of working on it um, seems a little bit conflicted. Well, uh, part of becoming a mature adult is realizing that any project in life, including relationship, will require that we put energy into how it can work better. So um, that, that began with study habits in grammar school. How can I do this homework so that I really learn something? So um, work does not mean tedious labor. It means putting in the energy so that something can function in the best possible way it can. We do this with our cars. We do this at our job. We do this in relationships. So I'm not afraid of the idea of uh, it takes work for a relationship to work. And I know you aren't either. But uh, you do have to learn some skills. And I'm hoping that I show some of these skills and give some of these tools in the book. Um, that's why it's called uh, Ready, How to Know When to Go and When to Stay. So when to stay is when you're willing to put in the work that it will take to upgrade the relationship so that it can work better for both of you. Hmm. Now, what is it psychologically that keeps people stuck in a uh, dysfunctional relationship? Uh, you don't think you're worthy of happiness. You don't think it's possible. Uh, you were taught to endure, as we said before. You uh, need to stay for practical reasons, such as you just mentioned. You have an arrangement in which you can only survive if you do stay together under the same roof, for instance. Um, and you mentioned fear of change in your- You have a fear that you won't survive if you're alone, it emotionally won't survive. You have the, the fear of facing life um, where you have to start over. You have the fear of change. Right. You can see how many reasons there would be to say to yourself, uh, just stay where you are. Now, you mentioned the word needs earlier in our conversation, and I'd like to address that. Um, because uh, you have some very interesting things to share on what our needs are, particularly when it's uh, involving relationships and the difference between having needs and being needy, um, which is an important distinction. And you, so how do you know if you're, what are your primary needs in a relationship? You mentioned the five A's. Is that what you're thinking of? Yes. Um, and they're the same five basic needs that we had in childhood. We have a need for someone to listen to us, to pay attention to our feelings. <clears throat> That's attention. Attention. We have a need to be accepted as we are, rather than to be made over into what the, our parents or our partner think we should be, or Except our religion. Acceptance, yeah. We have the need for physical affection shown, shown appropriately, either non-sexually in childhood, both non-sexually in childhood and sexually in adulthood. We have the need for um, to be appreciated and valued as we are. And finally, we have the need to for freedom to be allowed to make the choices that line up with our basic needs and wishes. So um, when I give those to someone else and when someone else gives those to me, that's called intimacy. If right, and if we're not getting, if we're not getting those needs met, that's a criteria for whether the relationship is a good one 
uh, for exactly. us and not uh, or, or that, not. Then, yeah, then we would want to work on it. How can I get these needs met? How can I help you get your needs met? And that's where therapy usually helps us. Couples. Right. And then in the book, towards the end, you bring up um, the mystery of timing. So, yeah. you know, this is at the crux of knowing when to go stay or when to go. It's the when question. It's the time question. And um, so, you know, you bring up the term synchronicity, which is a term that's dear to my heart as an I Ching author and as somebody who wrote a book on synchronicity called intuitive intelligence. It's, so um, how do we... In, in you know in your teaching how do we utilize synchronicity it's basically the idea of the time has come time has come for me to make my move the time has come for me to work on this so that it can work better the time has come to upgrade my situation the time has come to retire the time has come to change my job. The time has come to leave this religion or join this other religion. And you just automatically know it. And the synchronicity is the meaningful coincidence between your readiness and your making the decision. So you, and how do you know it? I mean, you say you just know it. How how do you how do you how do you just wake up that one you morning can? and you know today what? is the day. You just yeah. wake up one morning and you know. Oh, so it's the equivalent really of readiness. I mean, you're basically saying, "I wasn't ready before, but I am ready now." Okay, and that now is not in your hands. Right. So, and we've all had this experience. We've all wondered, gee, why did I wait 10 years instead of nine years or 11 years? Uh, I, just, I guess I just wasn't ready. Okay. And what is the role of grace? This is another concept that you bring up, and I love it. And you've talked about it in some of your other books. Tell us about grace. Grace is the gift dimension of life the special help that boosts us to be ready, that gets us ready, that helps us be ready. Uh, that is the uh, wonderful gift that comes to us. You could say it's from God. You could say it's from the universe. You could say it's from nature. You could say it's from deep within yourself. But you notice that even without putting in effort or without meriting, meriting something, that you just uh, realize you're ready and that you have, now you have the courage to change what you can change or the serenity to accept what you can't change. That prayer and the wisdom to know the difference is a description of grace. Because in all three, you would need the readiness. You can't just do it by your own effort. Uh, there's something that kicks in that uh, gets you prepared. Would you say that it could be described as a intersection between synchronicity and grace? Well, synchronicity is the archetype of grace. It's how it's right. one of the main ways that grace shows itself because we didn't create the coincidence, it just happened. Right. Or another way of saying it is in anything that happens, there's the opportunity for grace to come through. Well, we've only time. got we've only got like our another reaction. Uh, our response uh, should be gratitude. Gratitude. Sorry, I didn't mean, didn't mean to interrupt. Now we've only got a minute left, and so other than the obvious suggestion that people 
would benefit from reading your book. Can you offer some advice to our listening audience uh, as we close today's discussion? I guess uh, I don't have any advice, but I can say what helps me is repeating that uh, important prayer every day. May I have the serenity to accept what I can change, the courage to change what I can change, and the wisdom to know the difference. Right. So there you go. You got Everything the thing comes back to those three options. Right. And it's each beautiful. one of them has its own timing. Mm -hmm. You can't second guess it. You can't make it different. You you bow to the timing of the universe. So acceptance is like staying. Courage is like going. And the wisdom to know the difference is the timing. Yeah. That's a beautiful correlation. Hey, well, thank you so much for being on our show today. Unfortunately, uh, we've run out of time. It's been a pleasure. Time. <laughs> and I want to tell our listeners about your website, uh, DaveRico.com. That's D-A-V-E-R-I-C-H-O.com. And for those who may have tuned into Pathways Late, this is your host, Paul O'Brien, author of Intuitive Intelligence, a book that shares the theme of Pathways, which is personal and cultural evolution. Now, don't worry. You can play and or share this interview anytime you want via the internet or free podcast servers. And I'll tell you how in a minute. Today, we've been visiting with David Rico, author of the book, Ready, How to Know When to Go and When to Stay. And for those viewers on YouTube who might be watching this, um, Dave will hold up the book for us right now. Um, Ready, um, know, How to Know When to Go and When to Stay. And I want to say thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in to Pathways, which is broadcast and streamed on the internet at www.kboo.fm every Sunday morning at 8.30 USA Pacific Time. And even better, podcasts of today's show, which you can listen to and forward to others, are available for free at divination.com. That's spelled D-I-D-I nation.com, as well as via iTunes, Paulo's YouTube channel, and other free podcast servers. This is Paul O'Brien reminding you to tell your friends about Pathways Radio and Podcasts. And thanks again to Dave Rico and to all of you listeners for tuning in and being a part of the Pathways Conversation.